Hello, everyone. Our uh, speaker in this session is Andrew Lakoff, who I thought did not need a re re introduction, but I will introduce him nonetheless. And he is Associate Professor of Sociology and Communication at the University of Southern California, where he also directs the research cluster in science, technology, and society. He received a PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of California, Berkeley, and was a postdoctoral fellow in medical anthropology at Harvard Medical School. And he actually has been doing some really amazing work in pharmaceuticals and psychiatry and markets and practices, which I won't go over here. So please. Great. Um, well, I want to again uh, thank the Center for, for uh, putting the conference together, and I, I've been having a wonderful time listening. Um, this talk is actually prepared for this event, and it's brand new work that's, that's not directly related to any of my prior projects, which makes me both uh, enthusiastic and quite nervous. Um, but I can't think of a better audience uh, to present this to. And, and, and as you'll see, um, my strategy in, in approaching this material, which I found, found quite quite complex and, and, and fascinating, but but also um, difficult to make my way through, was to just try to get a clear sense of a story. Um, so you, you may find, uh, as I do, the, the the paper to be still somewhat under conceptualized, and, and I'm hoping that will actually provoke you guys to to help me um, do the do some of the, the 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 final framing analysis in relationship to the to the conversations we've been having at this workshop. So I I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, I put this presentation together very last, very late last night, so I actually managed to miss uh, to to, to um, mistitle it. It's actually called "On Failing to Preserve the Delta Smelt," um, and I'll describe what I mean by the the brackish zone, which is a, a name for a kind of salty water where this fish likes to live. Um, uh, my, my my recent work has been on how uh, planners and uh, and authorities um, envision and manage a potential potentially future potentially catastrophic future um, in areas like uh, pandemic preparedness. And, and in some sense, this follows that line of, of inquiry in thinking about two different kinds of, of experts, um, people in the world of ecology on the one hand uh, and in the world of uh, water management on, in, on the other, uh, and how they understand and try to approach uh, an envisioned future of increasingly mm. scarce uh, water and increasingly arid Southwest in the United States, um, and the figure of the this fish, the Delta smelt, really is at the center of that tension between hydrological engineering systems on the one hand and and ecosystems on the other. So it's a story uh, about uh, an endangered species of fish, the Delta smelt, and what measures should be taken to preserve it. And this story has been at the center of California water politics over the past two decades. So if any of you have spent time in California, you already kn probably know a little bit about this fish. Um, what's, f I think, from the vantage of this conference, um, interesting and, and perhaps somewhat puzzling is that the fish is, is really a non-charismatic species. It's not like most species that, that, that major um, environmental battles are fought over. Um, the, you, one thinks of, of the red wolf or uh, the, the desert tortoise um, or the, even the spotted owl. Um, this is a, a two-inch translucent bait fish that lives for about a year. Um, wasn't even really known until the 1970s. It was something that was caught by accident when, when, when um, surveyors went out to, to survey for other kinds of fish. And it was so abundant that um, hundreds or even thousands were typically caught and thrown away. Um, it doesn't seem to be very tasty. Um, it's not an object of, of human affection, um, even, even among the biologists who tend to study it, um, nor of economic value. It's not a keystone, keystone species, a species that the rest of the environment really depends on in any way. Um, and you know, the, the only s species that I think really appreciates it is the striped bass, which, which does eat it. Um, so, um, so the question is kind of why has this come to the center of, of California water politics uh, and the politics of the Endangered Species Act in the US? Um, and what I want to argue is that it's it's be because, at least in part, its, its demise is a sign of something else, um, which is the catastrophic, uh, the, p the possible um, destruction of a critical ecosystem, the, the San Francisco Bay Delta. Um, and so smelt endangerment stands for the problematic interaction of 
of human and ecological systems at this particular, particularly critical uh, juncture. Um, so just to kind of schematize uh, these two possible rationales for biopreservation, and we've been thinking a lot about um, preservation for its own sake. Um, one might imagine that you know, species have, have kind of their own right to exist. Um, but you don't see that case being made much uh, in the case of the smelt, but rather um, saving the smelt might be a way to save something else, which is much more important to, to ecological activists and environmental scientists, which is this uh, Bay Delta ecosystem. And I want to say a little bit about this ecosystem. And it actually points to our conversations from the last session around preservation and restoration. Um, it's, it's the West Coast's largest estuary. This is the, the Bay Delta, uh, just east of the San Francisco Bay, um, where runoff from the Sierra Nevada mountains snowmelt um, meets saltwater uh, from the bay um, as, it, as, as two river systems move westward. Um, and historically, it was a tidal marshland um, and subject to massive seasonal fluctuations as, as water uh, melted in the, in the mountains uh, in the spring. Um, and, and, and animals like the smelt are adapted to those fluctuations. This becomes important later in the story. Um, and there's a vision of a kind of Edenic past before uh, settlement of the American West when it was a, a, a site for a, you know, wondrous bird life and, 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 other, and, and also mammal species uh, and, and, and a tremendous number of native species. Um, but it's been massively transformed over the last 150 years. Dikes and levees were constructed to protect farmland. Um, irrigation canals have been put in. Uh, it looks a little bit more like a river system than a delta now. Um, but it's still home to, to uh, dozens of native, native species and birds. Um, but it also has uh, much, a much higher percentage of invasive species now. Um, something like 90% or 95% of the biomass is invasive species. Um, and some, of the, some, some notorious uh, uninvited guests or, 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 or um, now residents have come in, like the, the shipworm and the Asian clam. Um, some were actually introduced on purpose for sport fishing, um, such as the striped bass. Uh, but probably the most significant transformation in the Bay Delta ecosystem over the last 80 years or so um, has been the, constructive, the construction of massive hydrological systems that ship fresh water from the southern part of the delta to central California and southern California to irrigate the farms of the Central Valley and the, the growing urban agglomerations of the, s of, of the south. Um, OK. So uh, just quickly, there are two you know, major water provision systems uh, that pump water from the delta south. The Central Valley Project, which was built in the 1930s as part of the New Deal uh, by the Federal Bureau of Reclamation. Um, and it provides water uh, mainly to irrigate the Central Valley. Um, and as you may know, the Central Valley is, is, is a tremendous site of agricultural production for the US and globally. Um, and then the second major system was developed in the 1960s by the state of California called the State Water Project. And that, that irrigates the western side of the Central Valley, but it also importantly uh, provides water to, to growing um, cities of Southern California. And it's been actually critical to the last 40 years of development in Southern California to the point where it's a region, um, kind of it, it's a very arid region and, and somewhat amazingly uh, home to 25 million residents now. Um, Wait, pipes or canals? Um, both, actually. Both, you'll, and you'll see some of both. So, and, and this image shows, the, the main um, ones are aqueducts like this, which is a, which is a canal, but there are, also, there are also piping systems. Okay. Um, and so in, in, in classic 20th century infrastructural terms, uh, water managers uh, who, who shift water all around the state from the mountains through the delta um, along through central California to the south, think of it in terms of natural resources um, and, and natural resources or, or resources to be exploited for the purposes of economic development. Uh, this is a pretty famous image of, of water flowing uphill. So this is if you drive uh, down south from San Francisco, um, to Los Angeles, you'll pass through the, what's called the Grapevine, which is the mountain range, the San Gabriel Mountains, just before you get to the LA Basin. Um, and alongside you, water will be flowing upward with you uh, from the Delta uh, via the State Water Project pumps going through these, these pipes. Um, for the purposes of, of this paper, the, the key pieces of the hydrological system 
to talk about are these the two huge pumping plants that you see as red dots sort of in the, the right-hand side of this image, um, one for the State Water Project and one for the, California, for the Central Valley Project. Uh, and these pumps um, ship an average of 6 million acre feet per year, which is about 17% of the total fresh water that goes into the delta, and they ship it to the south. There's another um, five, 5 million acre feet that are also diverted in other ways. Now, an acre foot, I actually don't know this in the metric system, but in one acre foot is approximately 300,000 gallons. So if you think about 6 million acre feet, it's, it's a, a lot of water. Um, these are really big pumping plants um, the size of kind of huge parking garages. Um, and they are, they're, they're so big and powerful that they actually make the, the, the rivers reverse course in the delta. So normally they would be flowing um, east to west, uh, not exactly reverse course, but then they, they start to flow north-south. <coughs> the, the rivers flow north-south um, because of the strength of these two water pumps uh, at, 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 the southern, at the southern point. Um, and that sucks. Uh, thousands and thousands of fish into the pumps, which is called entrainment. Um, and there are special screens that are designed to kind of screen out these fish, um, but most of the fish die in the process of getting entrained. Okay. Um, so from the, from the vantage of the Delta ecosystem, um, the big problem uh, with all of this pumping of water is not necessarily the entrainment of these thousands of fish, um, but that not enough fresh water goes through the system to support existing habitats uh, that are necessary for the, for the historical uh, estuary um, system. Um, and that there's a, there's a, this leads to a kind of imbalance of, of salt water and fresh water and also a misalignment of seasonal currents uh, so that um, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of disruption. And that's part of what has led to um, the, thr ha the thriving of invasive species in the delta. Um, and the smelt uh, in particular is especially adapted to the more historical flows, east-west flows. Uh, and in particular, you can see that this image of where the smelt's habitat is, which is kind of the western part of the delta. Um, and what's important here is there's, a, there's a, a place that's sometimes called the brackish zone, which is a zone of low, uh, low salinity. Um, and it's precisely, where the, precisely the, the spot where the salt water from the bay meets the fresh water from the mountains in the east. Um, and, and uh, insofar as that zone is located in a, in a sort of generously sized habitat, ecologists think that's when smelt can thrive. But with the pumping of the water, the zone t this zone of brackishness tends to move toward the east um, and shrinks the habitat of the smelt. So the reason the talk is called this, the brackish zone is because a, a huge amount of attention has been paid to exactly where this site of low sin salinity should be located and how one can manage to kind of locate it in the right place at the right time so that when smelt are spawning, they have adequate uh, habitat, and I'll, I'll say more about that. Um, okay, so there's a general sense of ecological crisis uh, in the Bay Delta region um, that it's threatened with collapse. Um, uh, so it's a very dire crisis due, uh, it, it's agreed on to a number of factors, not only this freshwater diversion, but pesticide residue from Central Valley agriculture, uh, sewage runoff from treatment plants in the, sa in the Sacramento area, invasive species, disruption of, of the food web. Um, the smelt, for example, depend on the presence of a lot of phytoplankton um, that's eaten up by these clams. Um, and of course, uh, currently, um, as you all know, uh, very dire drought conditions, which, which uh, uh, makes there obviously less water available. Um, so, so, so freshwater is essential to the functioning of the, the Delta ecosystem from the vantage of, of ecologists and environmental activists, but from the vantage of uh, water engineers, um, the, the freshwater in the Delta is best seen as something that should be supplied and, and to, to Southern and Central California. Um, and if you send it through the Delta and out through the Golden Gate into the ocean, you're, just, you're basically wasting, you're throwing away these resources you could have had. Um, and so th there's, there's real frustration when these pumps, as you'll see, get shut off uh, for the sake of, of preserving um, a, a banal fish, uh, and instead the water is sent, um, east, is sent uh, westward into the ocean. Um, okay. Um, so this is the context in which the question of whether, one should, whether we should list the Delta smelt as endangered was first raised at around 1990. Um, as I said, the smelt hadn't really been noticed or thought about. Um, 
until then, um, but it was it was discovered um, kind of retrospectively. There are these what's, what was called as of 1990 the smelt index was created. Um, they had been collecting lot smelt over the years, really as a byproduct of of looking for other fish populations. But then um, a, a particular biologist who got interested in smelt d noticed by the early 1980s um, this massive uh, drop in the population, um, and and so by 1990 there were there was increasing um, motivation to, to have the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, recognize the smelt as officially threatened, and this is gets into the, the themes that um, <laughs> the, the themes that we talked about yesterday um, of, of how you how you list a species and why interestingly in the US any citizen can petition uh, the wildlife services for a species to be endangered and then the wildlife service um, makes a decision about whether it will be listed or not. Um, and there's not really a pretense that this is a, an objective, purely scientific process, um, and there's, there's a tremendous amount of lobbying and politics that goes on uh, in, in, in that kind of decision. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service um, did, in fact, uh, decide to um, list the smelt as endangered in 1993. Um, and it should be said that uh, so I should say that this is what happens if you list it. Um, it leads to these three kind of regulatory actions, uh, taking that is killing. One of these species is prohibited. Uh, critical habitat is designated. Um, and a recovery plan has to be designed. Um, so those are the kind of basic pieces of the Environmental Species Act protections. Um, but immediately in the discussion about whether to list the smelt, uh, for both sides of the issue, the smelt was understood as a proxy for, for larger questions around water provision, so you have the Metropolitan Water District, which provides water to Southern California cities, saying, you know, we don't have enough information to actually list this as endangered yet. Um, and then the Bay Institute and advocacy and environmental advocacy group saying, you know, this listing of the smelt could turn out to be the most important step in restoring the delta. So, so, so even from the beginning, um, the smelt per se isn't of interest to either side. Um, and the Fish and Wildlife Service also when it, when it announces the listing of the smelt, kind of shows that it's thinking of the smelt as an indicator of delta health more, more broadly. Um, and the, the, the smelt is a good indicator um, because it's particularly sensitive to change. It's dependent on, as I said, on this brackish zone, um, on the availability of food. So when, when the ecosystem is disrupted, the smelt seem to, to, to very quickly die. All right. Um, I won't go through the details of this. this there, there were a whole se series of initial attempts um, that were not in the, not so much in the legal uh, space, but in the regulatory space in the 1990s to improve the, the habitat of the delta. Um, all of these were seen to have basically failed by the early uh, 2000s. Um, this, uh, this event known as the pelagic organism decline, there was a sudden drop off not only of smelt numbers, but of um, pelagic organisms are just open, open water fish. Um, a, a whole range of open water endemic delta species of fish started to die. Um, it wasn't quite clear why um, as of about 2002. Um, and you see um, even the, the threadfin shad, which is really kind of an even, even less interesting fish than the smelt, was dying off. And you see this EP EPA scientist saying even the cockroaches are dying off, so something's got to be really awry here. So this sense of alert, this gets back to Frederick's discussion of the sentinel system. So, so this, this, this die off shows that something's really uh, amiss. Um, and at, uh, at this stage, um, <laughs> and I again won't go into, I can go into more details later, but there's an obs a somewhat obscure provision of the Emi Environmental Species Act that t says that federal agencies um, have to consult with the wildlife agencies, federal, what are called action agencies, like the Bureau of Reclamation, have to consult with the Federal Wildlife Service um, before taking any action that might affect an endangered species. Um, this is really critical because it, it sets in motion a, a tremendous amount of activity around how to preserve the smelt. Um, and what the, what the wildlife agency does at that point uh, in the initial phases of consultation is produce what's called a biological opinion. I talk about this in the paper in some detail. Um, but uh, the, the, this object, the biological opinion, um, which uses the services of a lot of uh, expert scientific consultants to produce, uh, really is the site of controversy over the next decade in, in, in court debates over, um, over how to preserve the smelt. Uh, all right. So uh, the National 
the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, so initially, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service um, says, oh, no, um, the Bureau of Reclamation's operational plans for managing these water pumps over the next several years won't affect the smelt. Uh, the, this uh, in legal uh, environmental advocacy group, NRDC, files suit, challenges this biological opinion. Um, and this judge, who's kind of an interesting character, uh, who's in Fresno in Central California, initially in 2007 rules for NRDC and says that uh, indeed pumping operations pose a critical danger to the smelt, an unacceptable risk. And he orders the F F Fish and Wildlife Service to produce a new biological opinion. They produce this 400-page um, tome, um, which completely re reverses the prior bio biological opinion and says indeed these wi the, these uh, freshwater diversions over the last several decades had massively decreased smelt population by reducing habit and, and altering this special low salinity or brackish zone um, and finding that the delta smelt were at the lowest level since 1967 um, and that the, the Reclamation Bureau's plan of operations would further reduce their, um, their population. All right. Um, the other sort of key piece of the, the biological opinion is this list of um, what are called prudent and, and uh, reasonable alternatives that the Wildlife Service then gives the federal agency that says, okay, so if you want to go ahead with the, uh, the operations that you had planned, here's what you, here's what you could do um, to mitigate the, the risk that you're posing. So they, 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 they d design a set of, uh, of measures, and I think these are really interesting because they're really focused on kind of temporary mitigation measures that would... Um, save a certain number of delta smelt to keep them from going extinct. So, so the idea is, that, and there are two key ones. One of them is to actually monitor and track how close the, the, the smelt are getting to the, um, to the pumps, because the entrainment events, these pumps are killing a lot of smelt. And one thing you need to know about smelt is that they can't really swim. Uh, they just float with currents. Um, and so, so, so if the pumping is going at a certain rate, they're just going to get sucked into the pumps. There's no doubt about it. Um, and so the, the issue is, what, okay, so what rate at what rate can this pumping be done so that the smelt don't get sucked too far, too close to the, um, to the pumps? Uh, so there's this interesting monitoring and tracking systems as well as kind of what's called the salvage index. How many smelt are we finding in our pumps per day? Um, and the, the pump operators are supposed to monitor these, these gauges and, and actually reduce or cut pumping in the event that they're in training too many. Um, and then the second big uh, regulatory um, uh, piece of it, piece of uh, rule, the regulatory rule they, the biological opinion gives is that they have to maintain this zone of salinity um, at a distance of approximately, uh, certain, at certain times of year, the spawning time of year um, in the late spring, at a distance of approximately 75 miles east of the Golden Gate Bridge. So you have to monitor just exactly where um, this brackish zone of salting, of a certain low level of saltiness is so that the, 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 the smelt can spawn happily. Um, and water managers are immediately realize that this is going to, this is likely to, to require a lot of cuts in the, the, the amount of water that's being shipped and, and at a particularly crucial time when they tend to ship a lot of water, uh, when the water is running off from the, from the mountains and they tend to ship a lot down to the Central Valley uh, and to Southern California. Um, so they, oh, and so there's a big um, public debate. This is when the smelt become quite famous. The Hannity, uh, Sean Hannity is a famous uh, right-wing Fox News personality um, goes on the attack, and it's a, the fish versus people in Southern California. An economic study shows that 80,000 people are going to lose their jobs um, because of these water cutoffs, and a big, big protests are are engineered. Um, I won't go into the detail. There's a, there's a conversation between Sean Hannity and and, and another anchor. Um, the, it's fish versus families. It really is. They're choosing the fish. They're choosing the fish. Yeah, two-inch fish, two-inch minnow. Didn't you used to use? Didn't you used to fish with minnows? It was bait fish, exactly. <laughs> So, so this is the kind of conversation that's going on, and you see um, the Ronald Reagan's famous words, uh, the, the scariest words in the English language, according to Ronald Reagan, are "I'm here from the government, and I, or I'm from the government, and I'm here to help." Um, so there's Barack Obama telling the Central Valley farmers um, I, and carrying a "Save the Delta Smelt" sign, "I'm here from the government, or I'm from the government, and I'm here to help." Um, okay. Uh, so the water managers counter sue. Um, it finds it that uh, the decision finds itself again in Judge Wenger's court in Fresno, and he um, rules for the plaintiffs again. He reverses his prior ruling, and, and he says that the Fish and Wildlife Service was was actually 
manipulated the science. It, 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 its use of science in the biological opinion was arbitrary, capricious, and unlawful. I mean, he goes into great detail in specifically criticizing the scientific calculations made by FWF. I won't get to go into the details here, um, but having to do precisely with these issues of how many smelts are getting trapped in the pumps and where exactly this brackish zone needs to be located. He's really annoyed by this discussion of the brackish zone. He calls the government scientists de de deceitful zealots. Um, he says this, this discussion of X2, um, it, 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 that, that, that if it's not located at 75 miles east of the Golden Gate Bridge, it's going to end the Delta smelt existence on our planet is false. It's outrageous. He's really angry about what F, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service is. And he also, I think, this is, and this is something to talk about later, he criticizes them for not doing cost-benefit analysis, that is, for not calculating what the value of smelt life is versus the value of all this water to, to Californians. And this is actually a critical piece of the discussion of, of the Endangered Species Act, which um, precisely instructs regulators not to do cost-benefit analysis and to, at all costs, preserve species. And so you're not supposed to be able to commensurate between the value of a species and the economic losses that you might have from preserving that species. So he, he violates that, and that is actually something, as, as we'll see, that the appeals court, so it's then appealed, the appeals court reverses his ruling and says, um, point one, um, Judge Wanger, you, were, you got too obsessed with the scientific details. It's not actually our job to think about the science. We, we defer to the Fish and Wildlife Service to, to make a reasonable judgment, and we think that they were reasonable in their judgment. Um, you turned this into a scientific forum, which it, it shouldn't have been. Um, uh, and point two, uh, we're not, um, it's, it's also not our job to do, a, it's not your job um, to do a cost-benefit analysis, to do these uh, fine utilitarian calculations that would allow us to, to make a, determine of a determination of whether smelt preservation was more important than um, the, the, well, the livelihoods of these Central Valley farmers um, or the water of Southern California cities. Uh, in fact, the duty of the FWS, FWS, the Fish and Wildlife Service, is simply to halt and reverse the trend towards species extinction, whatever the cost. Um, okay, so all these efforts unfold, and, and as of 2015, there seems to be good news for the smelt. The Supreme Court refuses to hear that the, the appeal of the, appe of the appeals court ruling, which means the whole court story is over, that 2008 biological opinion is going to stand. However, in, over that period, in the midst of this four-year drought in which, in fact, um, the Bureau of Reclamation has not been engaged in these emergency stoppages, it's been shipping lots of water, um, Smelt has continued to disappear uh, to the point where they're actually almost finding none of it. Uh, and, and as of the spring 2015, a couple of months ago, um, it's discovered in the, the annual trawl survey that there, there, there's very few smelt, and, and in fact, they're on the way to extinction. And this is the, the fisheries biologist who initially sort of discovered the smelt and tracked its, uh, its habitat. Peter Moyle says, we need to be planning for the Delta smelt's extinction um, and perhaps its resurrection. So that's the kind of coda to the story. Um, before I get to that quote, I want to just make two points about this effort to, s to save the smelt as a bioindicator, which I think, although, you know, it was a strategic uh, move on the part of Delta ecosystem activists to use the Environmental Species Act as a way of trying to, 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 to lower the rate of, uh, of freshwater diversion from, um, from the Delta uh, in order to improve the Delta ecosystem more broadly. But it was a very dangerous strategy, I think, as we see, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that it, it ended up focusing regulatory action in a very narrow way on exactly, okay, so all of the debate then became um, how precisely can we ship as much water as possible while still saving as many smelts as we can. Um, and then it also ended up helping uh, op opponents um, understand the issue as one of fish versus people um, rather than ecosystem versus agribusiness or something like that. Um, and then thirdly, once the smelt is extinct, all bets are off. Um, there's, there's the, you know, it's, it's, it's a relief. It, hmm? Distinct or says, but, but as the case is extinct, um, then, then there's no more means for regulatory action. It's, 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 it's not threatened anymore, and so you can't, you, you, you can't actually um, force the Bureau of Reclamation to, 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 to lower its rates of, of delivery. Um, so I'll just close with this image of um, the, the last refuge for the Delta smelt. The, the Bureau of Reclamation has actually funded a, a hatchery um, at UC Davis uh, for $10 million, um, a very sophisticated hatchery that, that plans and programs who the smelt breed with um, to maintain its genetic diversity. So, y so it's um, got uh, hundreds of thousands uh, of, of smelt in these tanks. 
Um, and uh, the director of the institute says the refuge population provides a level of protection against extinction. So the theory is, well, if, if someday the, the delta is indeed restored to its prior state, we can then reintroduce the smelt, um, if anybody is still interested in them at that point. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me stop there. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to move, why don't you move here? I think for the camera purposes, okay. that's good as well. Thank you, and we'll move directly to our commentator. Dr. David Shore is a senior lecturer at the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Law, where he teaches environmental law and legal history. David. Okay. No, it's not a mistake. Picture's coming in a minute. Um, so Andy's paper raises a lot of interesting issues. Um, and in order to try and answer Andy's question about how the ESA, the Endangered Species Act, is used, and why the Delta smelt has gained such prominence, I'm going to try and put this issue in its legal cultural context. Um, and I'm going to tell you two more stories. Uh, since he used the narrative method, I'm also going to tell you stories. Two more stories about the Endangered Species Act. Many of you know at least one of the stories. Uh, so to make things more interesting, I'm going to tell each story twice with differences between the versions. And then I'll try to think about what these stories mean for the case of the Delta smelt. So story one has to do with another rather non-charismatic fish. Uh, this one is called the snail darter. It's found in small numbers in the Tennessee River, in the eastern United States. Uh, the first version of this story, which I'll call 1A, is the one that most people who are aware of the case have heard. In 1967, the Tennessee Valley Authority, a New Deal agency created to bring electricity and economic developments to a very poor area of the United States, began the construction of the Teleco Dam on the Little Tennessee River. As the US Supreme Court explained, Teleco is a multi-purpose regional development project designed principally to stimulate shoreline development, generate sufficient electric current to heat 20,000 homes, provide flat water recreation and flood control, as well as improve economic conditions in an area characterized by underutilization of human resources and outmigration of young people. In 1973, a University of Tennessee ichthyologist, that's a fish scientist, uh, discovered near the mouth of the river a three-inch tannish colored fish, which you see here, which seemed to live only there. And in 1975, the Department of Interior listed the fish as an endangered species. Yet tens of millions of dollars had already been spent on the project, money which would be wasted were the project now to be stopped on the fish's behalf. Congress continued appropriating money for the project, with the appropriations committees repeatedly declaring that they wished it to go forward despite the harm to in the endangered fish. Opponents of the project sued to force the TVA to stop, but an injunction was denied by the district court on the basis of the absurd result that would ensue where a project on which so much money had been spent were to be stopped for small, unattractive fish. So in a, in a bold move, the Supreme Court, that, that is the US Supreme Court held otherwise, in the leading case of TVA versus Hill, Chief Justice Berger, who you see here, wrote, quote, it may seem curious to some that the survival of a relatively small number of three-inch fish among all the countless millions of species extant would require the permanent halting of a virtually completed dam for which Congress has expended more than $100 million. The paradox is not minimized by the fact that Congress continued to appropriate large sums of money, of public money for the project, even after congressional appropriations committees were apprised of its apparent impact upon the survival of the snail darter. We conclude, however, that the explicit provisions of the Endangered Species Act require precisely that result. In other words, the result required by the law is to waste the money, stop the dam, and save the fish. And that's what the Supreme Court ordered to be done. This story ends with Congress in 1979 passing an appropriations rider overriding the ESA as it applied to the Teleco project. The dam was completed, the fish were killed, and though a few small populations turned out to have survived elsewhere. Nonetheless, the fight against the dam and the Supreme Court's decision are considered salient episodes in the history of environmentalism and environmental law. Now, story 1B, which is the same story but told differently, uh, is as follows. The TVA, by the time it got to the Teleco project, had already built over 60 dams, squeezing all the utility possible out of the river systems of the region, but it wanted to keep building to justify its existence. Any recreation benefits were probably negative, as Tennessee already had 2,500 miles of impounded former rivers behind dams. Well, uh, it had more slack, what's called slack shoreline than the whole Great, Sla Great Lakes region. Uh, and, and the stretch of Little Tennessee behind Teleco was one of the last free-flowing rivers in the region. The same went for flood control benefits on the heavily dammed river. In other words, no real benefits. 
Opposition to the project began a decade before the snail darter was even discovered and came not from environmentalists, but from small farmers whose land was to be expropriated in favor of real estate developers, as well as history buffs and archaeologists opposed to the flooding of historic sites. The project was one huge boondoggle on the waste of taxpayer dollars uh, and a waste of taxpayer dollars. The Interior Department Committee convened in 1979 to consider overriding the ESA protections for the fish, concluded that in a cost-benefit analysis, uh, the supposed benefits of the project were not justified even when set against the mere 5% of costs remaining. Right, so this was a tremendous waste of money, even at this marginal point of analysis. On this account, the battle over Teleco Dam had little to do with human against fish and much more to do with common people against big business and an out-of-control government agency. In this telling, the snail darter was a red herring, so to speak, <laughs> offered, offering a powerful legal tool to opponents of the dam, but also diverting attention from many other important issues in play. It is noteworthy that the litigation and the decision in TVA versus Hill have been portrayed by both environmentalists and their opponents in very similar terms, as a victory for environmentalism and the survival of a species over human interests in development. Despite the seeming political advantages offered by version B, with its connections between preservation, social justice, and the rights of local landholders, environmentalists have preferred version A with its heroic theme of preventing environmental harm at all costs. Also telling is the fact that conservative groups, such as the Pol Pacific Legal Foundation, which was founded around the same time, saw the fight in the same terms, though they took the pro-development side, um, which is also interesting because those of you who are familiar with the Kilo decision and all the controversy over it in the last few years, <clears throat> the conservatives there attacked the law for allowing expropriation on behalf of development. Uh, and here, that's exactly what they're supporting in the, in the snail darter case, I think because when it comes down to it, they, uh, the, these conservatives, they hate fish more than they like landowners. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, okay, so that, that's story, story, uh, story one. Now story two is about another California species, this one even more uncharismatic than the Delta smelt, I think, uh, the Delhi Sands flower-loving fly. That's what you see here. Uh, listed as endangered in 1993, it's found only in the inland, inland empire of Riverside and San Bernardino counties, and its protected status has been blamed for halting development projects in this area. Here is what federal judge David Santel, who's a sort of infamous conservative judge of the D.C. Circuit, had to say in a case called National Association of Home Builders versus Babbitt. And this is, I'll call this story 2A. And quote, this case concerns the efforts of San Bernardino County to construct a hospital and supporting infrastructure for its citizens and other humans. Unfortunately, those efforts discomfort an insect, the Delhi Sands flower loving fly. The hospital proposes to construct structures for human use, and the humans using those structures propose to drive automobiles, each of which might disturb the fly. Unfortunately for the county and its citizens, however, the Secretary of the Interior has determined that the word take includes within its definition harm, and therefore activities which alter the habitat of an endangered species are covered by the, sta are covered by the statute prohibiting the taking of that species since the habitat modification might harm it. Even more unfortunately for the county and the citizens, the Supreme Court has agreed with that expansive definition of take. So, so he's relying on TVA versus Hill here, but criticizing it. Therefore, we may take it as a given that the statute forbidding the taking of endangered species can be used to prevent counties and their citizens from building hospitals or from driving to those hospitals by routes in which the bugs smashed upon their windshields might turn out to include the Delhi Sands flower-loving fly or some other species of rare insect. That's the end of the quote. So note that what Suntel does here. He takes the TVA, he takes TVA versus Hill's heroic story of the law upholding the rights of a small non-person, non-human, in the face of overwhelming human utilitarian calculus, which I called story 1A, and he turns it on its head using it to bludgeon the, EC, the ESA, TVA versus Hill, as idiotic and preferring the interests of smushed bugs over those of humans. So that's story 2A. And story 2B, is told by supporters of the fly, who also managed to find a more attractive <laughs> photo of the, of the fly, I think. Um, and you can see this is taken from the website of something called the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Uh, so here's what they say on their website. The Delhi Sands habitats are highly unusual, are highly unusual. So first, write a notice right away, habitats, right? Are highly unusual and are not found anywhere else on Earth. Protection of the fly is important in part because it will protect many other species also living in the dunes. 
These dunes support birds like the western meadowlark and the burrowing owl, mammals like the Los Angeles pocket mouse, a tiny buff-colored creature that fits easily in the palm of your hand, insects such as subspecies of the Mormon metalmark butterfly, as well as numerous reptiles and plants. Scientists have compared the Delhi Sands flower-loving fly to a flagship for the whole Delhi Sands ecosystem. Protecting the fly's habitat preserves important open space that also hosts a variety of California's native birds and other wildlife habitat in this fast-growing region, the open space that so many people move to this area to enjoy. And it's clear from the website that what really, really motivates this organization is the fly itself. Realizing, though, the danger of the TVA versus Hill narrative and that invertebrate conservation is probably better than save the bugs, but may not be something that the public will really get behind. So uh, their rhetoric takes in ever-expanding circles of concern. Protecting the fly will protect other beautiful and cuddly creatures. Protecting it will protect an entire ecosystem. Protecting it will preserve the open space that suburbanites want, and by implication, the value of their real estate. Environmentalists have come to realize that story 1A may have been heroic, but story 1B would have furthered their cause better on a political level. Anti-environmentalists, on the other hand, have embraced 1A, holding the ESA up again and again as ridiculous and harmful to humans. And now back to the Delta smelt. So once again, the ESA is the arena for a fight that has to do with a host of issues going far beyond the fate of a small fish, um, as Andy uh, pointed out. In my reading, the anti-environmentalists have embraced story A, smelt versus humans, as Fox News' detailed coverage shows. And I brought a couple more uh, quotes here from uh, Sean Hannity and friends. So Sean Hannity says, folks, there's, if, by the way, if you just Google uh, Sean Hannity, Delta Smelt, you'll get these videos right away. Said, Folks, there is incredible suffering in this region because of government that has put the interests of a two-inch Delta Smelt minnow before the people of California. And uh, his colleague Ainsley Earhart, reporting from the San Joaquin Valley, quote, 30 to 40,000 farmers and workers out here have lost their jobs, and it's all because of that two-inch minnow. So obviously that was, two-inch minnow is obviously part of their, uh, part of their message sheet. Uh, so environmentalists have tried to build a counter-narrative, arguing that the smelt is less important in its own right than as an indicator species, bringing in economic interests on their side, and so on. On a political level, the smelt may be doing the environmentalist cause more harm than good, and the legal remedies secured on the fish's behalf, such as fiddling with the timing and direction of water pumping, will do little to restore ecosystem health. Yet environmentalists seem unable to wean themselves from TVA versus Hill's heroic influence, maybe less for reasons of culture or inertia, than because of the legal power of the Endangered Species Act. As with many other liberal causes, environmentalists seem disinclined to pin their hopes on politics, preferring the hammer of the law. Though they may believe that protecting the Delta ecosystem is what is ultimately best for people, not just for the Delta smelt, they lack the confidence of their, in, their own, in their ability to persuade on the political level, and so they turn to what seems a safer route, riding on the slender back of the Delta smelt, using the ESA to achieve their water policy and land use goals. The ESA seems to have become a political liability, but a legal necessity, and no one seems to know what to do about it. Meanwhile, Sean Hannity is having the time of his life reporting from California. That's it. Only to say that, just to confirm that that lineage from the snail darter case to the Delta smelt is quite direct and explicit. If you look in, 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 in at the appeals court ruling um, overturning Judge Wanger's ruling, they precisely um, cite that 1977 majority opinion on um, we can't make fine utilitarian calculations. So, so yes, I, I agree with everything, and I want to just uh, open things up. I just say, some people say Berger's decision was calculated to present the Endangered Species Act in a, in a ridiculous light. Huh. Um, so, you know, it's sort of the conspiratorial view of it. Uh, OK. Anyone else care to ask comments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, OK. Um, so I, I wanted to take seriously your invitation to think about you know, the sort of bigger picture of the details. And I couldn't help myself by just looking up um, the smelt and, and its history in the Pacific Northwest, and lo and behold, um, it turns out that the smelt was um, greatly valued by Native Americans and documented in Lewis and Clark's diaries and was um, called by them a term that was translated as the salvation fish. 
Um, and so I just started to think about you know, the ways that saving figure in your story, and it just got me thinking about like who's, who's saving who. It's called the salvation fish because it would come back at the end of the winter in such droves. Um, that and it's like twenty percent. Is this the Delta smelt in particular? It's not the Delta smelt okay. in particular, but a specific Northwest okay. smelt. It would come back in such droves that it could sustain and mm -hmm. it had such fat it could like sustain people. I don't know if the mm -hmm. Delta smelt does this or different, but it just got me thinking about um, the different ways that, like, who's saving whom and the different ways that the smelt is being metabolized um, by the system. Is it being metabolized by people who are eating it or consuming it, or is it being metabolized by machinery? of agribusiness, and I just wondered if there was one to put it out there. It's just not anything you need to respond to, but as a way of thinking about different kinds of regimes of, or paradigms of smelt, human smelt um, interaction and ways of valuing smelt that can make us, can destabilize this, allowing Sean Hannity to have, to dictate a fish versus, like a single fish versus people um, it seems like there are other kinds of epistemologies that could be used historically or otherwise to throw into relief some of the kind of de details that get um, parsed in too many ways. Mm -hmm. as well, so. Great. Thank you. I was a bit uh, disturbed by the fact that the environmentalists in the uh, smelt case uh, admitted that they don't wish to protect the smelt in itself, the fish in itself, but they were concerned with the habitat. But beyond the use of this grander uh, term or a term, habitat, a concept which has grander illusions than a particular small fish which is unattractive, I mean, they, according at least in your uh, description, they didn't give any account of the value of the habitat itself. And that's, I think, a, a, a crucial uh, point they have to make. I don't deny that they can give maybe a better account or better story about the value of the habitat than about the value of the, uh, the fish itself. But first, it has to be proven uh, empirically that the uh, disappearance or extinction of the fish is going to destroy the habitat, or even uh, the ways in which is, it is going to affect it. Maybe the habitat will not be destroyed, but will be somehow changed, somewhat changed. And still, and as, as you mentioned in one uh, um, a passage in your presentation, the, the concern was in restoring the habitat. In restoring to what condition? I mean, the condition 30 mm -hmm. years ago, 300 years ago, a million mm -hmm. years ago. I mean, things have changed, and partly by humans already in the more distant past. Good, yeah. I mean, the and the term they use typically is ecosystem, oh, ecosystem. rather than, than habitat, although, you know, obviously they're, okay. rela they're related. Um, yeah, and they don't even make the case that, that the demise of the smelt will precisely affect the ecosystem, but rather that... Um, we the way one way that we know that this ecosystem okay. is in crisis because ecosystem, as you suggest, is an abstract word. What is right. an ecosystem? What, how do we know it when we see it? How do we know it's declining when we see it? Well, certain species are can can indicate to us that there's a bigger problem. Um, so so indeed, uh, and this is what you were precisely what you were suggesting in your comments. They 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 would have to articulate and do try to articulate the value of that ecosystem um, more broadly um, on aesthetic, economic grounds. Um, and, and there are allies mobilized. The fishermen of the of, of the Delta region are also on the side of the smelt here. So so I didn't spend a lot of time talking about the ways in which they advocate for the ecosystem, but I do think that the, they found the lever of the law, the Envi Environmental Species Act, to be a more powerful legal regulatory instrument than advocacy of the value of the ecosystem. And that's why they ended up relying, well, that's that's why they ended up relying dangerously on the, on the smelt. And I, the last point I would make... Former. Um, is that indeed the other problem of the abstraction of the ecosystem and the concept of ecosystem restoration is precisely uh, what ecosystem are you going to restore things to? Uh, there's no hope or, or, you know, or, or imagination of, of bringing things back to how it was 200 years ago. Um, so then there's a question of is, is restoration the right term? Um, what, what, what precisely do you want to make out of the delta if, if not just a dead zone that has been had its life kind of sucked out of it? Um, I want to pick up on the beginning of your, your question, Dabi. Um, 
you know, uh, I would like to try and distinguish between how the legal cases have been um, produced and what the scientists themselves, how they perceive about, about the charisma of the fish and kind of to challenge this uh, um, notion that they're non-charismatic. Um, <laughs> because this seems to be an assumption here, but actually scientists, fish scientists that I've spoken to from the Southeast in particular, um, have been uh, very charmed <laughs> by, and they speak in terms of intimacy and passion and dedication to these fish. So I kind of just want to highlight that, that in, in their narrative, there is that kind of charisma of like uh, I've got particular people who are like the the, the, the I mentioned to you the regional director of the uh, southeast uh, region of uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, just his love, his passion for fish, and so the smelt in this context is just one fish, and I mentioned to you uh, the the Gila trout, the struggle to um, to protect the Gila trout in, in New Mexico with helicopters coming in and saving it from wildfires. Um, and then reintroducing it, culling all the non-native fish around it so that it doesn't kind of hybridize. Um, uh, those issues with the Gila, with the, with the Rio Grande silvery minnow, scooping them up, you know, with spoons uh, and uh, when, when the ponds are drying, taking them to hatcheries and then reintroducing them when the ponds are, are there again after the pumping season. So there's a, there's a whole context to this particular fish uh, within that region. So, um, so that's to the charisma aspect and also kind of the context of conserva conserva fish conservation. And so I also would challenge this idea that they are just indicators. Um, so I connected to that aspect of charisma. I think um, that again, in my, in my personal kind of communications with a lot of these scientists, they would save them uh, whatever. Uh, happens even if they can't survive anymore in the so-called wild, mm -hmm. and that's indeed kind of the narrative that my book, uh, that well, my book wildlife focuses on. What happens when the habitat is no longer there for reintroduction, and that happened in specific cases like the Parak pullfish. So there is no more so-called natural habitat for them to survive, and they survive in pools that are um, that are so so-called artificial, and so um, it is that survival and. Um, and what happens to these species when there's, like uh, one ecologist says, well, they get all dressed up, but there's nowhere to go to. Like, they, they, there's no nature to reintroduce them into. Should we still save them? And there's a whole debate now, like when I interviewed the director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, his opinion is, well, at a certain point, we will have to euthanize because we don't have the resources to just keep and keep all these captive species who are, like, just uh, becoming extinct. Um, but then the people who work within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, there's a huge uh, ethical debate whether they can actually uh, uh, let die in that way, um, even though it's kind of constructed as passive. Anyway, so, so, so that's one kind of uh, uh, interesting uh, context to kind of think through. Another one, um, and, and sorry if I'm thinking too, too, too much, uh -huh. um, is the regulatory framework, right? Because you're highlighting this hyper-regulation -regu that is happening here through the ESA, and I think that's a really important thing to know. Um, and I would actually uh, conceptualize it. So you're asking us to kind of um, conceptualize, help you. So in my framework, I use Foucault to kind of show the move from sort of conservation, or s species conservation in particular, from, from sovereign power to biopolitics in the high, high level of, of regulatory regimes within the biopolitical framework. Um, I guess um, it was interesting to me that they were only uh, listed as threatened, as you said, not endangered, um, and then also that there was a protection of habitat and what happened to that, just kind of factually. In your paper, you say that there was that protection. And um, finally, well, I guess you, um, I think uh, it was unclear to me what your what your thoughts were about the captive wild divide, because you seem to kind of, in the end, kind of indicate that you were, oh, they'll only survive in captivity. That's kind of, that seemed like you were undermining that possibility. And I was kind of hoping that, that maybe uh, to bring about like a more critical, like, you, you, you know, there's not just captive versus wild. There's all these various constructions of 
recreating habitats in situ and and then you know there's a whole variety of inter situ uh, spaces and even beyond that that I, I could uh, discuss with you so that bifurcation I feel uh, should should be questioned great thank you very very helpful comments I, if I can respond to at least a couple of them um, on the scientists perception I would say that there's definitely a lot of efforts at care for the fish. And, you know, it took a lot of knowledge and work to learn how to get them to reproduce uh, in captivity, um, to, to, to learn about and know about their habits in the wild and, and so on. And so I, I definitely think there's a lot of affect connected to the fish. Um, I, wouldn't, I still wouldn't call so far as to say that they're charismatic for the scientists, but they definitely, you know, they're definitely very invested in the survival of the fish, and it would be worth talking to them more about understanding why. Um, there's also this interesting kind of bureaucratic question of why this Federal Bureau of Reclamation is spending $10 million on the hatchery um, because they don't have an affective relationship to the fish. They're, they're interested in pumping water, and I think it must have to do with just requirements under the Endangered Species Act, given that it's very close to extinct in the wild. They, they're, they're sort of dealing with mitigating that by sponsoring the hatchery. Um, on Foucault, I mean, you know, part of why I'm spending all this time on the brackish zone is that you know, kind of implicit is this government of the living. I mean, there's, uh, you know, how do you, how, how can you know and try to, uh, if not optimize, at least sustain the, uh, the, the very language of, of the court opinions, sustaining the existence of, of the smelt on this planet um, is very biopolitical. So, I, you know, I, I have that kind of in the back there. Um, and then um, just the last point about the captive wild divide um, yeah I think that's worth following I, mean, I think that there that there's it is likely that that there, there may be other kinds of in-betweens that will be created uh, around the Delta region that would be sites that might be possible for, for reintroduction um, so it wouldn't sort of just be the, the, the in the tanks um, because I think even for the scientists that you know the resurrection language that that Peter Moyle uses um, you know they're, they're just living in the tanks isn't isn't what they're after. Um, they, you know, they want to, they want them to go out and thrive somewhere. And in fact, um, he he even would like to. This gets back to the question, the point of uh, of consuming the smelt. He would like to be able to develop a taste for smelt okay. among the the population, so that we could farm smelt and sell it as as. And that would be a way that the smelt might survive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Shall I last comment? Okay. Maybe we can collect a few if there's uh, oh, sorry. if we're limited on time. Yeah. So, uh, Andy. Um, so one, one way of telling the story is, and I think this was even uh, reinforced by uh, David's wonderful comment, is, is that, there, there, that there are two different things going on here. There's the law, uh, and, and somehow the law is out of sync with the real interest, or maybe, so I, I'm emphasizing out of sync. There's also ideology and other interests, but there's also a, a question of development. So when the law was created, the discussion was about extinction and preservation, and now the the ecological discussion has moved forward to conservation and and to uh, ecosystems, and it seems like the, the law is out of sync with that. So people make use of the law to the extent that they can, uh, of, and and if, if this is a tension, it's a tension, and this is related to the workshop more generally, between preservation as looking more about the past and and ecosystems looking maybe a little bit more about the the present and the and the future in this. So this is also uh, also a tension. Uh, that you started off with when you were talking about what the interests are. But I wonder whether this is the case, and this actually relates also to, David, to David's point. So I wonder whether people are using the law, and the law is simply stuck there in the 70s, or whether there is a reason why this is how it's, it's framed. And this is not just uh, opportunism or anachronism by the, by the law, that the, that the challenge is, so uh, what would a revised law look like? Uh, and this goes back, I think, also to Iris's point about the list and how the list, on the one hand, is so powerful, but then it's all the time changing. Like, it's not really a, a list anymore, I think. Not exactly, not in the 70s sense. And maybe also to Etienne's uh, talk about the changes in the, in the way this is taking place. So, anyway, so the, the point is, what actually, more than just anachronism, leads to this legal uh, solution? And to David's point, whether you actually need to point to something and to be able to, so this is not just an indicator, because if you wanted indicators, you'd have to have more than one. I mean, you wanted to have, if these are indicators for the ecosystem, you'd have to have like 20 different things. But you want to look at something and say, okay, this is, 
this is dying, this is becoming extinct, this is something concrete that we could actually point to, which you can do, or much harder to do with echo, echo uh, ecosystems. And, and it's a specific way also in which this species is, is, is envisioned as becoming extinct. So it's not enough that we bring it in piles and throw it back into the, that's not gonna work, that's still considered somehow extinct. Anyway, sir. Let's take one last comment. Um, I was thinking, um, how um, the smell is an indicator rather than a sentinel. Uh, and um, uh, if we follow Ted Porter's analysis, the indicator is not pointing a thing, but a trend. Mm -hmm. And as you said, the, it, 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 it's all a question of what is the optimal ecosystem and the optimal distribution between uh, water, uh, salinity. Uh, and, and I was struck by the fact that there's no enemy Whereas in uh, Sentinel, there is an enemy, and the question is whether the birds are on the side of the enemy or our friends. And, and so that, that produces a real uh, divide between those who are with the birds and those who are with the humans. Uh, and for example, in your case, there's no fight. Uh, there's, th there's no defense of a zone that would be close to preserve the smell, as, for example, the bird reserve. Um, so, so I, and that, that, that there's no, that's why the scientists are caring for the smell, but they're not defending the smell against humans. So that's why the fish versus people doesn't work. Um, well, we'll have to talk more about this, the, this, this sentinel concept, which we, we, we've co-written a paper on, but, but don't, but, but I actually want to think more about the relationship between indicator and sentinel. I think, um, you know, I mean, if a canary in a coal mine is a sentinel, um, is it because there's an enemy? Is it? Um, is, is it simply the, fa the capacity to warn of some, some threat that, that's on its way that's imperceptible, which is kind of what I had, what I had take. I had a, a sort of more general notion of what the, what, what the sentinel is, but I think I will take your point about looking at Porter's analysis of indicators. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I like this bigger question that Shai is, uh, is pointing to, and, and David as well, that, that is kind of, um, is there something that, it's, it's, a, it's a, I guess it's a kind of, cultural question about what, what can we get attached to um, and, and whether you know, the smelt seems to have not quite functioned but, but, but have nonetheless been somewhat necessary, um, some kind of living being that, is, that, that seems to be dying and that, that, that there's a tragedy and I think that, that, that indeed even though I, I made some light of it and I didn't spend a lot of time emphasizing it, there is also a strong language of the tragedy of, of extinction in, in, in the delta and the smelt is kind of a, one of various exemplars. There's a lot of fish, endemic fish going extinct. Um, and that that is a particular kind of tragedy that people can understand in a way that is harder to understand when you talk about an ecosystem in, in distress, in part because the delta, you look at it, it doesn't actually visibly necessarily look like an ecosystem. It looks like there's a nice set of rivers. If you don't know a lot about ecosystems, it might look perfectly fine. There's a lot of life there. It's just not endemic life. It's, it's invasive life. Um, and so what it means for it to be in crisis uh, is not necessarily obvious. Okay. Well, thank well, you very much for a very, very interesting session.